Hello and welcome to what is a, a kind of evening um, event. I'm Samira Ahmed. I'm in conversation with best-selling author and journalist David Wallace-Wells. And this event is a partnership between Penguin Books, South Bank Centre and Cambridge Literary Festival. Um, David Wallace-Wells was due to take part in a whole season of spring literature events um, at South Bank Centre, looking at climate breakdown and ways in which artists are connecting with nature writing. Um, and the environment. So do keep a look out. There will be online events via South Bank Centre's digital channels, particularly on World Earth Day, which is the 22nd of April, where there will be new poetry commissions in response to the Hayward Galleries Among the Trees exhibition, as well as activists and artists responding to our current strange situation. David was also due to launch a major climate emergency theme set to run throughout the spring edition of Cambridge Literary Festival and guest curated by Caroline Lucas, MP. Um, so the events of David Wallace Wells in London and in Cambridge were for, uh, were programmes, as you can imagine, before the words coronavirus and uh, COVID-19 were part of our vocabulary and long before the words furloughing and quarantine became everyday terms. We are very much in uncharted territory um, and I have always felt reading this book that the work of David Wallace Wells couldn't be more prescient. Um, David said in a recent article, three months ago you'd probably never heard of the disease, now in the space of just a few weeks it's completely upended your life and the lives of billions of others. So tonight, David Wallace Wells is discussing links between the coronavirus pandemic, the climate chaos he out outlines in his Sunday Times, New York Times bestselling book, The Uninhabitable Earth, A Story of the Future. Um, David, thank you for doing this. You're speaking to us from New York. I'm in London. Um, and I was reading your book through February and early March when the COVID-19 um, pandemic was just developing. And it struck me even reading it that early on, it seemed more relevant by the day. And I wanted to ask first how you felt watching the whole virus pandemic unfold. Well, first I want to say thank you um, for speaking with me. Thanks for um, setting this up to do remotely. It's great to be having this conversation and sad it's not in person, but um, we're all managing the best we can. You know, honestly, I, um, I find myself in a little bit of a strange place thinking about um, the coronavirus, even though I've been doing a fair amount of thinking and writing about it. I spent the last few years in a certain way preparing to deal with apocalyptic visions arriving in the present. That's a lot of what my work about climate change has been, um, sort of thinking a little more, a little further down the line and um, with sort of purposefully open eyes about just how bad things could get. Um, I was, I thought of myself as someone who was sort of out there trying to do what I could to take in the possibility of some uglier futures in part to share them with the world so that we could make choices to help us avoid them, but also because I just thought it was worth doing as a journalist to share the alarming news from science um, as it was arriving. And that meant on some level, I thought I would be relatively well-equipped to deal with a new um, apocalyptic future arriving in the present tense. And instead what I felt is a little bit overwhelmed, a little bit disoriented. I'm sure that many other people are feeling this way too, but when I first came to climate as a subject, I, I saw it pretty quickly as a sort of an all transforming feature of our lives. But while I saw, you know, the sort of beams of refracted light coming out of that prism of climate, I also felt pretty early on that I could see the prism itself clearly. And with coronavirus, I'm still in this stage when I'm, I'm looking at those, you know, those violets and those yellows and those oranges, following those particular storylines um, as best I can, but I haven't really been able to wrap my head around the whole story. Um, I think in part that's because of how quickly it's arrived and how ill-prepared we were, not just at a political and social level, but I think as with climate, at a kind of intellectual level, um, for how to think about an event of this kind, which came into our lives, as you mentioned, in the space of really a few weeks or a few months, depending on how you want to mark it, and in just that amount of time has completely transformed the way that we are living now. Now, it's not clear to me, I'm sure it's not clear to many people, how long these changes will last in the sense of how long the quarantine will last. I think it's also not clear how long lasting, um, you know, the, the sort of changes we might make to our, to our um, daily lives going forward will be either. But just at the present tense, in the present tense, I think it's really important to just sit with what a dramatic transformation we are living through today. 
the entire Northern Hemisphere, billions of people have completely transformed their lives, living in really restricted, in some ways punishing forms, subjecting themselves to an enormous amount of economic pain at the very least, for the benefit of those around them, out of a sense of global solidarity and care for others. And, you know, honestly, that is not something I would have thought was possible. No. Well, I want to break down into some of the sort of specific details, but then also come back to some of those big issues that you raised. A specific thing, very quickly, we saw news stories about sea life returning to the Venice canals, wildlife and flora spreading back into newly quiet towns and cities. Does it feel like an opportunity to reset people's default view of the world and what's normal? I think um, some of those early stories, while they're kind of beautiful and amazing, are a little misleading. Um, you know, China had a really dramatic drop in its um, air pollution levels such that some academics think that as many as 20 times more people had their lives saved by the collapse in air pollution produced by the economic shutdown than died from the coronavirus in China. In Los Angeles, we've had skies much clearer than they've been for decades. And in Delhi, where the air quality index at this time last year was 999, almost literally off the charts and three times what was considered a dangerous level, has fallen all the way to 45, which is practically speaking pristine, beautiful, clean air. Um, but those are all quite short-term effects. In China, they've already started um, rolling back environmental regulations. They're planning um, more intense fossil fuel infrastructure than they had been before the coronavirus because they want to sort of juice the economy. Similar dynamic is playing out in the U.S. already as well. So I think those, um, those sort of visible environmental gains are short-lived. The question is, what do we do with the incredible opening of the political horizon that this um, event suggests for us? As I mentioned a minute ago, there's been a more radical transformation of the way that we are living than I think most of us considered possible just a few months ago. And, you know, we have to figure out going forward um, how much of what we once thought was unmovable, unchangeable, unshakable about modern life, especially in places like the UK and the US, is now subject to revision and reformation. And on that, I don't know where we're heading. I think it's quite notable that the fossil fuel companies um, are already angling to take advantage of these, um, of these changes. You know, they're try trying to, um, in the US, um, get as much help as they can out of the stimulus bills that we've been been um, promised. Um, I think there is a public desire to re-engage and revitalize our economy in ways that will be more environmentally responsible than we would have before. And yet I think there's a competing impulse to see the recovery um, generated as quickly as possible. And I think in some cases, um, we can move more quickly and more productively by being more green. But in other cases, if we really want to snap back in the space of two or three months to where we were in December or January, um, I think policymakers may feel compelled to um, give a hand to the fossil fuel business and, and to put off sort of major renovations and reformations like building a new electric grid or expanding our renewable capacity. So I think as with everything else on climate, ultimately, it's a political question. And I don't yet feel like our politics has been transformed by COVID-19 so much as the opportunity to transform it has been revealed to us. And the question is now what we do with that opportunity. I want you to take you then into the book. And one of the things you look at is how recent it is, in a sense, that so-called fossil capital has become the norm in how we think about what is acceptable and the value that we place on things. Can you tell me a bit about the concept of fossil capital and how it helps us understand uh, climate emergency? Well, I think, you know, I speak in part just personally as someone who, you know, grew up in New York City in the 1990s, um, you know, an American at the end of history and the, you know, the, big, you know, the peak age of globalization, the time of imperial swagger for Americans. Um, but I grew up thinking that history was a story of progress, that the future contained a more prosperous time. And while there were going to be setbacks and frustrations and political shortcomings, um, which we had to fight to overcome, nevertheless, in the long view, things reliably would get better over time. 
Um, that really is a creation. That idea is a creation of the Industrial Revolution um, before, depending on where in the world you're looking, but anywhere in the world before about year 1700, there was no reliable um, economic growth to speak of at all. Every generation lived only as prosperously as the generation before. Um, whenever there was any kind of innovation or increased prosperity, it was quickly sort of eaten up by, um, by a growing population. That changed in the Industrial Revolution, and especially in the UK and the US, we are living in a kind of conceptual model that was given to us by that progress, where we now expect, or did expect until quite recently, that the next, every generation would probably be better off than the generation before. And in fact, when we didn't see those gains, even over, say, a decade um, timeline, that there'd be a lot of there was a lot of political frustration um, with how slowly things were moving and the stagnation um, of our economic systems. That is um, especially, you know, it's, it's especially concerning revelation, given that there's a way of looking at the Industrial Revolution and this, in, this kind of invention of economic growth which we've become so addicted to and dependent on, um, that it is all about the um, extraction of fossil fuels and the burning of them for the benefit of our industrial economies. Um, now, personally, I think that the story is a bit more complicated than that. Um, I think that a lot of the accounts of social innovation and entrepreneurship um, that have been put forward by, by scholars over the decades to explain the rise of um, of modern capitalism are legitimate and insightful. But I think that um, it's also the case that we would not have the economy that we have today built on several centuries of quite steady, reliable economic growth if it were not for the power of um, wood and, carp and oil and coal, um, which really, in a sense, um, represent just the sort of you know, we, we were able to introduce into our economic system all of this extra value. We basically dug up coal. It had power contained in it. When we burned it, it released that power. We didn't have to do anything to produce it. We just had to dig it up. And so it was a sort of an enormous amount of value just added to our economic system, which then allowed us to innovate and, um, you know, uh, produce all the, all the goods and services and, um, and, you know, all the aspects of the modern economy that we've come to depend on. Now, the question is, if we have to retire the use of fossil fuels um, for reasons of the environment, what will that mean for our future? Um, you know, it seems to me that the change in um, cost structure around renewable energy means that really just over the last few years, we're beginning to see that we wouldn't have to give up much if we retired fossil fuels. In many parts of the world, renewables are now um, cost competitive with oil and, and gas and coal. In parts of the world, it's actually cheaper to build new renewable infrastructure than it is to continue running old fossil infrastructure. And that's incredibly exciting. On the other hand, we're going to be making that transition at a time when the world is beset by all of these climate impacts, which collectively could have a really meaningful um, dampening effect on economic activity. The degree and scale of that is up for debate among economists, but there are certainly quite respected pedigreed ones who think that un, un, um, you know, a, a climate, ch climate change um, future in which we do nothing about um, carbon emissions, by the end of the century, we could have a global GDP that was 30% smaller than it would be without climate change. I think that's, those estimates are probably a little bit high, but it's worth keeping in mind um, as an anchor point because it's twice as deep as the Great Depression, that impact, and it would be permanent. So at the, at the, at the moment when we're finally beginning to see what a post- fossil economy would look like, we're also now dealing with an unprecedented or beginning to deal with an unprecedented amount of climate impacts, which could undermine our um, models of economic growth, which are not just models. They really, I think, especially for people in the UK and the US and part, other parts of Western Europe, they form the very basis of our relationship to the world and the future and our children and our parents. That sense that history is moving us forward towards more abundance, more prosperity, more justice and more equality. All of that is, if not, um, you know, if that promise is not destroyed by climate change, it is at least called into question and undermined to some degree. The question is, what kind of, um, what kind of system, what kind of social structure can we develop that will allow us to be resilient in the face of those changes? to allow us to secure some of those gains, if not all of them, and how will we have to adjust our expectations going forward if we're going to be living in a world um, defined by these challenges rather than defined by this sort of 
reliable arc of growing prosperity. It's interesting that I think the 2008 crash started this impact of younger people really noticing that their lives were not going to be better than their parents and they were noticeably worse. And that's without factoring in the impacts of climate change. I think it's very interesting how that sort of perhaps has predisposed them to be um, more interested in, in the likes of Greta Thunberg's campaigns. Um, but I was interested as well in your book, you talk about the danger of blame. Um, and you say the blame for saying the blame for global warming lies exclusively with, say, the Republican Party or its fossil fuel backers is a form of American narcissism. And you say that that's going to be broken by climate change. Can you explain what you mean? Well, I think there are a few different aspects um, of the sort of blame, the climate blame game that are worth thinking about. I mean, obviously, fossil fuel companies are much bigger villains in this saga than anyone else on the planet, um, or maybe um, tied for biggest villains with the politicians that enabled them. But I think that um, I would make a couple points. The first is that I think that all of us, including me, including just about everybody on the planet, except for Greta, um, is living themselves in a kind of climate denial. We are not yet really reckoning with the scale of changes that are certain to come, and we are not devoting our lives to securing um, a relatively comfortable life, life for ourselves and everyone else on the planet. In the face of those challenges, we are ourselves suffering from a kind of denial, even those of us who consider ourselves quite committed advocates. And that is how powerful the psychological reflexes are that push us away from considering quite scary scenarios, even planning for them. Um, and I think that means we have to start thinking a little bit differently about those people who have enabled um, more directly enable this sort of system to run out of control. Um, I think on top of that, you know, we all of us benefit from the product or have benefited from the products of the fossil economy. We are living in prosperous nations in part because of those benefits. And many of us are uncomfortable um, with the idea that we would have to give up some of those benefits in order to transition to a more responsible relationship to the planet. Now, Personally, I think that the state of renewable energy in particular suggests that we wouldn't have to, that we could actually be more prosperous in it if we were also more, um, more green. And actually, for the first time, I would say most economists in the world, world agree with that. They used to be on the other side of that argument, but they've, they've moved quite dramatically over the last couple of years. Um, but I think that suggests that each of us has a role to play in supporting this kind of damaging social, um, energy, social and energy infrastructure. Now, there's that sort of individual versus systemic question of villainy in which each of us are responsible to some degree um, for this dire state of the planet, even though there are certain actors, the fossil fuel companies, their executives and their enablers in, in politics, who are much, much, much more responsible. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's useful to see it as a continuum um, because honestly, that's, that's the way it is. Those fossil fuel businesses wouldn't be as profitable as they are if we weren't using their services it wouldn't, um, and we wouldn't be as rich as we are and comfortable, comfortable as we are if it weren't for those, um, those companies. And we've made that bargain ourselves. As much as I like to personally focus on systemic issues, um, I think we have to understand that this is a, well, frankly, it's a systemic problem in which all of us are implicated. Um, it's not just a matter of, you know, 50 companies or 70 companies or a couple hundred politicians around the world. And if we get them out of office, and get them, um, you know, and close down those companies will be fine. We really have to change the entire system in which all of this is unfolding. Then there's the question of, of um, na national responsibility. And, um, you know, in the U.S., the U.S. is historically responsible for the world's largest share of carbon emissions. So to a certain degree, this problem is a problem created by America. At the moment, though, um, the U.S. is in second place. China is actually producing almost twice as many carbon emissions as the U.S. is. The U.S. is um, on track to decline and China's on track to grow. So that gap will grow further. Um, but I think in America, in American politics, we often, we like to point the finger at the other side and say, these people are the only people standing in the way of progress. And I think it's undeniable. The Republican Party has been um, in service to the fossil fuel business for a long time. Um, but frankly, the Democratic Party has been basically in service to the fossil fuel business for a long time as well. And when you look around the world, there are many countries who don't have nearly the, um, the sort of disinformation or denial culture that we have in the U.S., um, where fossil fuel companies are not 
quite as explicitly or obviously um, manipulating the governments of those nations. And yet there are very few countries anywhere in the world that are doing better than the United States on cutting their emissions. Um, there are some that have made much more ambitious pledges over the last year or two. That is, um, there's, there's a real divergence there between a lot of the nations of Europe and the US. But if you look at the long term, what we've done over the sort of 30 years that we've really known this is a problem, practically speaking, um, all nations of the world are behaving abominably with that information. Nobody has made meaningful progress yet. In fact, most of us have continued to um, grow our emissions over that period of time. And that makes me think that um, the impact of, say, the fossil fuel companies um, funding denial campaigns in the U.S. and indeed the whole culture of climate change denial, which is globally centered in the U.S., is much less significant than the systemic issues that I was describing earlier, where all of us actually quite like um, living well in, in a way that was in part powered by the fossil fuel companies and almost everywhere in the world, fossil fuel companies as a result have quite a lot of political clout. Um, we need to change that more fundamentally and not just in the US. Can I just ask you to break down then when you talk about some of these consumer choices that really scale up, what are they? Because on a literal level, we see things like cruise ships, these giant skyscrapers on their side, and we know the level of pollution they produce, suddenly that whole industry overnight has just stopped dead, and it turns out we don't need to be on cruises. Um, obviously, we're talking about many more things, something as simple, I guess, as people driving cars, but what are the big choices that you feel we'll need to fundamentally rethink? Well, ultimately, I don't think it's a matter um, to lay at the hands or the feet of individual consumers. Um, I do think that it's a systemic problem. But if you're looking at the individual carbon footprint, and I should say this amazing historical fact, the idea of the carbon footprint was actually introduced by BP as part of their rebranding campaign in 2005, I think, when they were trying to market themselves as beyond petroleum. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the carbon footprint, which has become the basic um, conceptual model for how we think about individual responsibility was given to us by a fossil fuel company that wanted to avoid responsibility for this crisis. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> um, but if you're looking at the components of an individual, an individual's footprint, um, for someone living in the UK or the US or an equivalent country, equivalently de developed country, um, the biggest share of that person's footprint is likely to be air travel. Um, you know, a round trip ticket from New York to London melts three square meters of Arctic ice. Um, the a round trip ticket from New York to Los Angeles is the equivalent of eight months of driving. Driving is also quite, um, quite bad. That sort of comes in second. And then um, what you can do in your diet um, matters quite a, quite a lot as well, especially if you're um, consuming a lot of red meat, which is um, quite fossil fuel intensive. Those are the biggest units of an individual's carbon footprint in a wealthy country like the UK or the US. But when I think about um, what we need to change, I don't think we need everybody to go vegan or give up air travel, in part because I don't think that that's practically speaking um, feasible, especially when you consider how many hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of people in, the, um, in, in Asia and the developing world are just beginning to get wealthy enough to afford air travel and afford red meat and are very excited to take advantage of that and see huge cultural and economic opportunities in taking advantage of it. I think it's much more helpful to think of this as a systemic problem. We need to rebuild our electric grid so it doesn't waste two thirds of the power that we put into it. We need to have a new kind of plane that flies on something other than um, fossil fuels or produces a zero carbon um, emissions. There's some work being done on that, but it's not far enough along as far as I'm concerned. We did massive in investment in public um, transportation, zero carbon public transportation, mm -hmm. and we need um, a real focus on electrifying our automobile fleet globally. Um, you know, on top of reformation in the way that we raise agriculture so that um, when we do produce red meat, it isn't nearly as carbon intensive and there is some um, there are some sort of small scale studies showing that that would not just be possible, but in fact, we could do it using existing um, sort of pre-modern agricultural methods if we chose to deploy them. But all of these changes are, I think, too big to be enacted, not just by single individuals, but even by massed individuals. Um, and that's why I think it requires um, policy change, not just at the national level, but really at the international level on all, in all of these sectors. Um, industry, agriculture, infrastructure, energy, um, because big picture, I think it's really important to understand 
and it's actually, I think, quite poorly understood even by people who think of themselves as quite climate conscious, that in order to stabilize the planet's climate at any temperature level, even a really hellish one, we need to not just reduce our emissions, we need to totally zero them out. We need to completely eliminate them. If we're sitting here in 2075 and the world is at three degrees Celsius of warming, and we're only producing a tiny fraction of the carbon we're producing today, say five or 10%, we will still be heating the planet further, even just with that five or 10% of the carbon that we're producing today. If we wanna stop global warming at any point, we need to get all the way to zero. And doing that through reduced or changes at the, at the level of individual consumer choices seems incredibly difficult, I would say even impossible to believe that not a single person on the planet would ever want to fly an airplane again, or not a single person on the planet would ever want to eat a single hamburger ever again. It's much easier for me to imagine innovation driven by public policy that would allow us to fly in a different way and raise our beef in a different way. And I think we can do that on a much shorter timeline than the kind of cultural change that would be required to enact these transformations through um, changes at the individual level. Interesting. I want to talk about the issue of alarm, which is central to the book. Um, the choice to be less alarmed until you see the consequences is exactly where we are with COVID-19. People waited until it started to become real. And by then, to some extent, our choices were limited and things uh, were a lot worse. Um, has COVID-19 made it easier, do you think, for people, for governments to grasp what climate change threatens and the level of action required? Well, I think it's a little early to say, but I certainly think it's possible. What we are seeing is a dramatic, as I mentioned earlier, dramatic expansion of what seems doable um, in the modern world and in modern politics. I think, you know, a few months ago, any American would have told you, oh, it's ridiculous to think that the U.S. will enter into a national shutdown where nobody is leaving their homes, nobody's going to work um, without you know, for the, for the, because of the threat of a, of a pandemic, that would have seemed completely beyond the capacity of our society to engineer. And yet here we are. I think now I'm hearing from a lot of people who are looking at um, sort of preliminary plans. I put that word in quotes because I don't think there really are any plans for how we move from shutdown to um, gradual reopening of our societies. But to the extent that there are preliminary plans, people are looking at them and saying, oh, there's no way that Americans would submit to this kind of medical surveillance state that is required to allow us to go out into the world again before we've completely beaten this disease. Um, you know, th they're doing it in, you know, in, in South Korea and China, but those are very different societies, people say. Um, I think it's quite likely that in six weeks or eight weeks time, we will be doing exactly that. And we will have, again, completely transformed our sense of what is possible and achievable, even in a relatively short amount of time and um, given, you know, sort of willingly accepted an amount of government control and government um, authority over our lives that we thought would, would have been impossible to conceive of just a short time ago. I think those lessons, um, they certainly echo in consideration of, of climate change. I think that a lot of um, the other lessons of COVID-19 echo as well. I think it's a reminder that we live within nature, no matter how um, protected against it we might feel, no matter how outside the bubble of the natural world we might think living in a place like London or New York City, indeed we are still subject to nature and natural forces um, in the form of pandemic disease, but also in the form of climate change. I think, as you mentioned, it's also a lesson that the better prep we do, the earlier, the better off we'll be even in the medium term and long term. And if we can do whatever we can to limit the amount of warming that we have to adapt to, it'll be better than adapting on the back end. And there are a lot of other lessons, both at the social and the political lesson uh, at level that I think we're learning collectively about, about climate from COVID-19. But what worries me is that we are going through now an unprecedented um, reckoning and transformation and um, interruption and disruption um, in order to protect ourselves against this particular threat. Mm -hmm. And I worry that when we're on the other side of it, we will feel at the individual level, but also at the political level, exhausted. We will feel exhausted personally. We will just want to get back to normal. And we will feel that our political capital and our literal capital were exhausted in all of the, in everything that had to be done 
to get us back on our feet after this deep interruption. Now, different societies and different political cultures can deal with this in different ways. Um, some of them probably healthier than others. But in the U.S., it's unfortunately, I speak as a, you know, a liberal Democrat, it's unfortunately the case that we're enacting all of these stimulus measures now with a Republican president and a Republican Senate. And that means that the shape of those stimulus measures is defined in part by Republican ideology, which is moving, it's, it's changing in the face of COVID. They're willing to do a lot more. They've even talked about starting a universal basic income and nationalizing the airlines. So things are moving. And yet, when it comes to something like how green will the stimulus be, the best that climate advocates could have achieved in, in the last round of stimulus uh, negotiations was a kind of a stalemate where there was as much support given to renewable energy as there was to the fossil fuel business. In a different environment where there was a progressive um, executive and a progressive legislature, we probably would have had much more significant um, stimulus spent on um, the rollout of renewable energy and, and green infrastructure, which is really what's necessary. Other countries in the world um, are, doing, are following that path a little more closely. But in the US, by the time we are, um, the earliest we can hope to have a progressive leader and um, the, with the support of a progressive legislature, which is January of next year, um, we will have gone through a year of unbelievably dramatic federal spending, um, much beyond anything that had ever been talked about and certainly enacted before, probably eight times as big when, it's all, when all is said and done, maybe more than the 2009 stimulus, which completely handcuffed um, Barack Obama throughout his entire presidency. It was such an albatross, um, all of that spending. So when theoretically we have Joe Biden as um, you know, a new president in 2021, which I don't think we can count on, but which is, which is looking more and more likely by the day, um, unfortunately, I think that he will also be handicapped by the amount of debt that he's left with by um, the spending that's done this year under President Trump. And while I think politically and intellectually, we are um, a little less concerned now on the left, but really truly across the economics profession, with federal debt and deficit. People are more comfortable with more aggressive Keynesian spending than they were coming out of the Great Recession. I don't think we've moved that much. I think some of these old habits die hard in particular because in the US case at least, many of the politicians who will be negotiating these terms are the same politicians who were in office then. And while they may be a little more open to additional spending in um, 2021 on top of what they did in 2020, I think that unfortunately, the scale of what's possible in a major um, climate initiative is gonna be considerably smaller than it was if we didn't um, go through the coronavirus crisis. One of the big anxieties, which I think you probably are aware of, and other people who think about climate change a lot are aware of, is we've yet to have a major climate-related emergency on top of COVID-19. I mean, in Britain, we had terrible winter floods, um, and. I'm just wondering if they were to hit again now, I know hurricane season will be coming up in the United States and the Caribbean. That on top of what's already going on, we haven't even begun to think about that double whammy, have we? I think only a very few people in the climate community have, and it's absolutely terrifying, especially when you start to think about what kind of evacuations would be necessary. You think about the combination of wildfire season in the American West, um, I mean, if you're in a shelter in place situation and there's a wildfire burning through your town, how do you, how do you deal with that? On top of which, the main, the main piece of um, respiratory protection that firefighters use um, when dealing with forest fires is the N95 mask, the respirator mask that is in such short supply that um, many doctors in the US who should be using them have had to deal, have had to improvise other solutions. So if we have a significant wildfire season again this summer, while dealing with um, significant shelter in place orders, I think at the very least in California, they're gonna be um, having to ask some really tough questions, balancing these, um, these dilemmas. And I think it might ultimately, as you suggest, make us considerably more um, concerned about climate. But I'm worried about the other alternative too, which is that we've sort of already so significantly normalized um, our experience of um, climate crisis in particular, in, in the form of, of, of wildfires, um, that we start to treat it as background noise and really fo continue focusing on the pandemic crisis because it is so front of mind. And this is something I've, I've written about, I wrote about a bit in the book, but I've written about a lot more since. Um, it is one of the things I'm really most worried about, generally speaking, going forward, 
which is that we, rather than responding to, um, to accumulating climate crises and climate impacts by acting more aggressively to prevent future ones, in fact, we just adjust our expectations so that we find acceptable higher and higher levels of climate suffering. And I had this experience last spring when I was doing reporting in California in the aftermath of their horrific 2018 wildfire season. And I went out there expecting to do a lot of interviews and meet a lot of people and write a sort of a postcard from our climate future in which people would be overwhelmed with climate anxiety and climate change would be a front and center concern in their everyday lives. And what I found instead was that they had already moved almost entirely past this totally unprecedented and indeed quite harrowing, horrifying experience of the past year where, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of acres were burning um, simultaneously and, you know, whole, whole parts of Los Angeles were, were functionally dis destroyed by fire. Um, these were people who said to me when I asked how they were feeling about the fires, oh, you know, we've always had fires in California. And I had to say, well, yeah, but the fires last year in LA were twice as damaging as any fire that had ever come before. These fires are five times worse than they were in the 1970s. You know, I, I spoke to um, the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, the year he was born, um, 60,000 acres burned in California. The year he was elected mayor in 2013, it was 600,000. In 2018, the year he was, 2017, the year he was reelected, it was 1.2 million. And um, in 2019, was that the years anyway the, the year after it was 1.8 million so we've gone we've gotten this incredible incredible rise in recent memory and the people i spoke to out there had barely even processed that they said um you know this is how we've always lived i met a woman who lived long enough in malibu to live through nine fires and she was only considering leaving now because she had some changes in her family structure and i said to her how could you look at this landscape which has burned nine times since you've been living here and think that it's livable and she said to me, you know, you're from New York, right? And I said, yeah. And she said, you guys had Hurricane Sandy. And I said, you know, fair point. Mm -hmm. um, all of us, I think, are collectively normalizing this suffering in a way that allows us to cope with it emotionally, but may cripple our ability to deal with it. And I saw a further instance of that this past year in Australia, where the wildfires were I think the data is 15 times worse than the worst California wildfire season in history. A billion animals died. Tens of thousands of people had to be evacuated on a beach from scenes that was felt lifted out of like some combination of Dunkirk and Mad Max. Um, you know, the air quality in Sydney was, was so bad that fire alarms were going off in office buildings thinking that the only explanation for there being so much smoke in the building was that the building itself was on fire. Um, they couldn't navigate the ferry, they had to stop ferry service because the ferries couldn't navigate the smoke in, in Sydney's harbor. I mean, really incredible, unprecedented amounts of, of um, destruction and devastation in, in a, a kind of a first world city, which is um, a kind of a new experience. Most of the suffering like this we've seen in the past has been in the global south. And yet, the rest of the world, you know, we paid attention to it briefly, and then we turned away, and we just sort of like accepted the fact that the entire east coast of Australia was on fire for a period of three months running. and now. Australia is dealing with the coronavirus crisis. They're actually one of the few countries in the Southern Hemisphere that has been hit dramatically by it. And already there, the fires are already sort of receding into a relatively distant past as a kind of a permanent, unfortunate, but permanent and maybe unchangeable feature of life in that country, rather than this horrifying immediate threat that we have to mobilize dramatically in the present tense to fight against. This issue of the division between the affluent north and the south, a huge issue in climate change in general terms, the strange situation with COVID-19 where, for the beginning at least, it was spread by the vectors of mass affluent air travel through the north, but there is real anxiety about it emerging now in, in poor countries in places like sub-Saharan Africa, and a real fear that perhaps there won't be interest. I and mean, we've already seen this issue about you know, the, the block on exporting uh, masks and equipment, even to places like Canada and, and Europe, this fighting of national boundaries. What's your view on this North-South division? I think it's um, maybe the most uh, unfortunate, terrifying, tragic feature of both of these stories. 
I, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, I've been really moved by what I take as a kind of performance of incredible solidarity that's now unfolding across the Northern Hemisphere, where just about every person in all of those countries has completely changed the way that they're living um, in order to protect one another. But I think that there's another way of looking at that same phenomenon, that to the extent that they're doing it willingly and are comfortable um, living by these restrictions, it's not out of solidarity, but out of a sense of personal fear and that they don't want themselves to get sick. And when the threat is distant, they will respond in very different ways. I think when you look at the recent history of um, climate concern as it unfolds around the world, I think it makes you pretty pessimistic that as COVID-19 spreads into the global South, that the affluent countries of the world will do much at all to, um, to help fight it. And, you know, the responsibilities there, I think, are different than they are with climate change, because I think in general, while there are important questions to ask about how China handled the early stages of this disease and the way that they may have um, made it harder for the rest of the world to respond adequately, nevertheless, they bear much less responsibility. Um, no one bears any kind of responsibility for this pandemic in the same way that the um, rich countries of the North bear responsibility for climate change. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that, you know, you can think about um, the issue of climate reparations emerging over the next decade or two as a country like India suffers really intensely from the impacts of climate change. Some estimates suggest that they'll um, receive, that one country will receive fully a quarter of all climate impacts. And in fact, that estimate undercounts how dramatic the impacts will be because of the economic differential. It's like, you know, flooded real estate in India doesn't, caught, doesn't add up as much as flooded real estate in the UK or the US. And so probably by any human terms, they're going to be suffering even more than that one quarter suggests. And of course, that is a country that was, you know, the um, ruled by the UK during the age of the British Empire when industrialization and the burning of fossil fuel was introduced to the world by that empire. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, the U.S. is historically a much bigger contributor to um, the fossil fuel problem than the U.K. or any of the other countries of the West, um, which opens up that question as well. What does the U.S. owe to a country like Bangladesh or India, or for that matter, to Saudi Arabia, which has um, developed over the last couple of decades in large part um, to serve the oil interests of American businesses in a way that has ultimately produced enough carbon emissions and participated in a carbon economy that will make that country itself, Saudi Arabia, quite unlivably hot in relatively short order. So what is our, our responsibility to those nations of the world? I think is very much an open question. And I think to the extent that it's been asked on a global stage to this point, which I would say it, to the degree it's been asked, it hasn't been asked sufficiently or adequately. Nevertheless, it has been answered with a kind of deafening silence. Coming out of the Paris Accords in 2016, there was um, a fund established that was meant to channel money from the countries of the global north to the countries of the global south to allow them to adapt to some of these impacts. And um, hundreds of billions of dollars were promised. And I think the number of the number the amount of money that's actually made its way into that fund is something like seven billion dollars. So a tiny fraction of what was promised. And what was promised was totally inadequate when you consider that you know. Globally, we promise and it's like $100 billion or something like that. The seawall that they are now contemplating building in New York Harbor to protect just New York City, they say is going to probably cost about $100 billion. So we globally promised the amount of money it would cost to build protection for one city against one kind of climate impact. That was the amount that we promised to the entire global south. Mm -hmm. And then we only delivered a tiny, tiny fraction of that money. Um, to this point. On the pandemic issue, I think the disparities are likely to be just as dramatic. And I think that that's a kind of, or maybe even more dramatic. And I think that that's a moral, a deep moral abomination. I don't think there's really any other way to put it. You know, I have a, a two-year-old daughter and a lot of people when I'm, when I'm talking about climate change will ask me, what do I want to, how do I want to talk to her about climate change when she's old enough to really understand it? How does climate change um, factor into my own thinking about how I'd, how I'd want to raise her. And, you know, what I often say is that um, the most important lesson I want to give her is the same one I'd want to give her without climate change, which is just human empathy. And to try to regard the suffering and pain of people living elsewhere in the world 
no matter how distant and no matter how differently they look, as if not totally equivalent to your own suffering, as close to equivalent as you can possibly um, engineer. And I think we're living in a world today where unfortunately sort of the opposite tendency is unfolding, where people are um, coming to regard those living elsewhere in other cultures and other countries as even less human than they might have thought a few years ago to think of the, the basic unit of our experience more and more as the nation and those living outside our borders as more and more foreign and therefore antagonistic at a time when because of climate change and now because of this pandemic, I think we need more and more of a sense of our collective humanity and shared fate and less and less of the kind of um, nationalist populism that is at the moment sweeping the globe and making any approach to climate change, um, I think, considerably harder. Well, it's interesting that you have been quick in your recent writing about the pandemic to pick up on the very martial language being used by a lot of leaders, particularly the British and the American uh, Prime Minister and President. And yet, they've also been promoting the idea that radical response is wrong. What's your take on the, the political presentation of the pandemic and how it relates to thinking about climate change that we need? Well, um, I think there's sort of interesting, both, both of those countries are interesting case studies in, in sort of different ways. In the UK, um, you had an, an initial effort to be sort of too clever by half, um, by um, trying to follow the, the, you know, the, the herd immunity approach, when in fact the science and the data was quite clear. But, um, you know, if you squinted and looked at a particular set of papers, you might um, draw a different kind of conclusion, which was a little more amenable to a leader who was unwilling to really trans uh, on, you know, turn on a dime and, and really transform um, the way that people were living in his country. I think you saw an equivalent um, with climate change over the last few decades when the science has been quite clear. The program that science insists we undertake is quite clear. And yet often our leaders are looking for excuses or reasons to not take that, take that action. In the US, we've had a president who, is, we have a president who is revealing himself more and more every day, less interested in his own expanding his own authority, which is something that a lot of people on the American left feared Donald Trump would do in the, in the face of a crisis. He would just become an authoritarian leader to the extent that he could. He seems much less interested in that than in just um, unburdening himself with the responsibility of dealing with a crisis at all. Faced with the choice of empowering himself but then having to own whatever results, he's chosen instead to say, this is not my problem, which is um, a horrifying evacuation of leadership. But it also puts all of the um, governors and mayors of America in a really difficult and complicated position because they don't have the budgets to um, produce the kinds of responses that are necessary. They don't have the public health expertise that the federal government does. And so we have, we have all of these individual actors acting kind of independently, um, often ignorantly. As a result, you know, recently the governor of, of um, Georgia and the mayor of New York said within a couple of days um, last weekend, oh, we just heard that there could be transmission of this disease by people who are asymptomatic. Now, anybody who had been following the science had known this for 10, 12 weeks at that point, but that information hadn't gotten to some very important executives um, in New York and Georgia. Now, that's mostly an indictment of them. If they had even been following the news, they would have known that. But I think ultimately, it is an indictment of the federal information bureaucracy because no plan was put forward, no um, vision of understanding that they could all work off of and, and work from. And I think generally speaking, there is some value in what in the US we call a kind of federalized response with a lot of people trying a lot of different things. I think that's likely to be the case on climate change too. It's not that we need a single global plan that every single country um, enacts um, the same because countries are different, opportunities are different. One country may, you know, just very broadly, maybe more suited for wind power, another for solar power, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I also think it illustrates both of these cases that we need a kind of collective, um, a shared collective understanding of the problem and of the necessity of moving quickly. The more that we share information and share best practices and share strategies, the better off we'll be in dealing with the crisis. And that's one of the reasons I think, unfortunately, um, there are some legitimate um, 
concerns and, and frustrations with the way that China has dealt with um, the coronavirus crisis because a lot of the data we now have, the early data on which we formed our basic understanding of the disease seems likely to have been massaged at least and maybe outright distorted. They may have had as many as 20 times more deaths in Wuhan than they've reported. Um, the age skew has turned out to be very different in, the, in Europe and the US than it was in China, in part because I think a lot of their initial data was, was incorrect, which I think all is just to say that to the extent on climate that we can be um, working in the same informational environment, collaborating to the extent that we can collaborate, sharing best practices and indeed sharing technology, the better off we'll be. And this is the case, you know, because ultimately climate change is a collective action problem individual nations themselves face a really perverse set of incentives where they're with almost without exception they 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 produce only a tiny sliver of carbon emissions and so if they think to themselves if we decarbonize incredibly rapidly even immediately but the rest of the world isn't doing the same we're going to be living functionally in the same climate 10 or 20 30 years from now as if we did nothing at all yes. That is, I think, one of the reasons why so many nations of the world have failed to take action to this point. And unfortunately, it's even logic that holds for the bigger emitters. The U.S. is 15% of global carbon emissions. China's 28%. You know, if China went from 28% to zero, it would have a noticeable impact on climate change, but it wouldn't totally change the course of the planet unless everybody else on the planet moved at the same time, which is, again, another reason why we need to be moving together. Um, we need to... We need to know that if as individual nations, we take steps to protect ourselves against the pandemic or against climate change, that other nations will be doing the same. If you know, one country in the EU is absolutely fantastic in shutting down coronavirus, but all the other nations in Europe are terrible, that, that, that gold standard nation is still gonna be suffering because of the, um, the inevitable you know, um, transmission across borders similar dynamic in climate change. Um, and I think we need to come to some sort of understanding of our collective responsibility and our path forward so that we can move in unison. But I also think we need to be talking more explicitly about how um, the incentives facing individual nations are not as grim as the, one that I laid, the ones that I laid out, um, even though that has been the way that most nations of the world understand the problem. Because especially when it comes to public health issues, um, the benefits of decarbonizing are localized, they are contained within national borders, and they are, um, they are significant even when tallied on a pure you know, economic growth basis. And that means that the argument for individual nations to decarbonize is not just for the benefit of the whole world, it's for the benefit of their individual citizens and indeed their economy. And I think especially on public health, we haven't talked enough about that yet. Well, I want to talk about you know, the individual then, you know, for the, which one of the dilemmas of facing up to climate change has been dealing with the scale of it. How would you advise, people who haven't yet read your book, um, to t take the book at a time when many are feeling, you know, many of us are feeling really afraid, we're turning away from the news, the coronavirus is just in the forefront, and the last thing some people may be thinking is that I want to confront the other issue of climate emergency, what would you say? I would say you can't avoid it by turning away. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of this kind of psychic cost of contemplating and confronting this terrifying future. I mean, I've, I've sort of lived that experience more dramatically than, than most people over the last couple of years. Um, it's had some psychic cost on me too, but I think ultimately, um, if you're worried about the psychic cost of contemplating this future, you should be more worried about what it would be to live in that future. And taking action and responding to it requires reckoning with it. So turning away and bunkering down is not, you know, it's, it's, um, it won't be helpful even in the medium term because it will collectively produce a future with um, more rampant warming and more rampant climate damages. I'm so conscious as I do that we were really out of time, but I've, it's been so fascinating talking to you. I also have to say, I've never known a man with such a head for figures. You just have them all yeah. there for, for a recall. Um, in a sentence or so, are you overall optimistic that this pause we're on because of COVID-19 could be a valuable moment to get us thinking in the right way about tackling climate heating? 
in a sentence. Uh, it's so much more complicated than that. I would say um, it's the same, the same answer I give on climate generally, which is that, you know, optimism is just a matter of perspective. And if what you're hoping for is a world that is preserved at the climate, as the climate, the climate as it is today, we really have no hope for that. Things are going to get considerably warmer and there's going to be a lot more suffering as a result. But if you base your, um, your sort of expectations off of the, the path we're on and where we're headed, we can do a lot to avoid that. I think we are, or we will and are already doing a lot to avoid that. And so the difference between where we're likely to end up, which I would say is probably somewhere about two and a half degrees of warming the century, and where we're headed without any action, which is maybe three and a half degrees, is an enormous achievement and deserves to be celebrated. Similarly, with coronavirus and what it opens up, I think that there are new possibilities that it opens up. I think that we will take advantage of it to some degree. But if you're hoping for a global political revolution in which climate change is solved immediately over the next year in the immediate aftermath of this pandemic crisis, because we've had our eyes and minds so wide open um, or opened because of this experience, this existential experience, I think unfortunately that you're probably being too optimistic and you have to base your um, your sense of progress, not off of a best case scenario, but on how much we can do to avoid a worst case scenario. Uh, so beautifully put. And I think it brings you back to what I loved about the uninhabitable earth, which is one's eyes are open, your eyes were open, and it's important to read it. But it isn't as if there's a, a magical solution. But I think knowing the facts is the most positive way to be prepared for, for finding and attempting a solution. David Wallace, well, thank you so much. If you haven't read The Uninhabitable Earth, you should. Um, I found it terrific. Thank you again. Thanks so much for having me. Great to talk to you.